Hi, I'm Kim Brown. Glad you could join me today. And with us also today is fellow Level 4 Utaptics practitioner, Chip Brown from Michigan. Welcome, Chip. Thanks, Kim. Glad, Glad to you be could here. be with us. Mm -hmm. So, Chip, tell me, what do you feel like, in your opinion, is the most profound lesson that people need to learn today? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think responsibility probably rates pretty high because um, it's so pervasive, the, the lack of responsibility. We see it in politics. We see it in our world. We see it in um, schools and that kind of things. Um, the inability to step up and be decisive or to um, take responsibility for their emotions, their thoughts, uh, what they want or don't want. It's difficult. Um, it's difficult because um, we learn growing up that uh, very often that our parents want to be responsible. And if they want to keep us as children inadvertently, they keep us in the role of a child, mm. which is one of yielding, um, not being assertive and not speaking up. And it's fine when you're a kid, but the problem is when you get to be older, that's not quite very effective. Uh, but their patterns grow early and it's difficult to recognize and move out of those. And even uh, many religions and other things support that same attitude because it's a position of authority and control. If you're responsible to them, responsible for them, then uh, they control how you think, what you do, all those kind of things. So it's disempowering. Mm -hmm. And the truth is it, to move into empowerment and control, we have to take responsibility. There's just no other choice. So how exactly does someone go about doing that? Well, it's a, that's a big question. And actually most therapies support that kind of attitude, shifting responsibility away from who did it to me, why it happened, and into our response of, okay, what can I do? What am I willing to do? Uh, and how can I do it? So logically, somebody first needs to decide I'm willing to take responsible, be responsible. And then it gets confusing from there because the question becomes, are we responsible for them, for something or are we responding to it? One is active and one is reactive. Hmm. The logic is if we want to choose whichever it is, the first place we go is inside ourselves. So if you have this experience of feeling responsible for someone or needing to respond to someone, you notice the emotion. What are you feeling about it? How does it feel? And once you do that, then you can look at, okay, so what's the most effective response? Is this person doing something to me or are they just doing something? Ah. And that's one of the things that I learned over the Christmas holidays. I have a rub with family members. I know that's unique. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I'm probably the only person that has that, I know. But uh, I realized in trying to manage that, that very often I had dovetailed what they did as the same as doing to me. And the truth is they weren't the same. Sometimes this person just did what they did and had nothing to do with me. But I was so used to and fearful of being responsible for how they acted. I made the leap and the link into believing that whatever they did, I was responsible for. And that's a distortion, obviously. So when I started making that distinction between are they doing something to me versus are they just doing something, see, I was able to notice that. Yeah. And saying, oh, you know, that's just that. And it wasn't. And it actually deflated it. And it also made the distinction, okay, so when they do do something to you, that you feel uncomfortable or anxious, hurt, they verbally aggressive or mean spirit or something like that. Now 
you notice the distinction, and now it's time to know how to respond to that experience versus being responsible for it. We both know as fast of T and most modalities that we can't control other people. We just can't. It's not within our world of power. But we can respond to them. And so being responsible for ourselves is not just being responsible for our emotions and no, by noticing them. It's also responding to what happens to us in an effective way. And when I say effective, what I mean is when somebody does something to you, that's when we need to be aware of our personal boundaries and then speak it. Now, the point of that is speaking it doesn't mean they're going to change. They're still going to do whatever they do, but it honors us. It honors our choice. It honors our experience by saying, I disagree with this. I don't appreciate it. I don't like it. I don't want it. Now, they may comply or they may not. But the point is we honor ourselves by being responsible for our experience and communicating that effectively. And that is empowerment. That's a sense of control that we, we need. Now, ultimately, if they continue to do it, we don't endorse or we can accept what they do. That doesn't mean we, we uh, are complicit in it or that we, we support it or saying, well, that's okay. They're just doing that. We don't have to do that. We can choose to act if they continue to misbehave or behave in a way that's unacceptable to us. And we do that by how we move forward in the world. We can distance ourselves or take some other sort of action. Meaning if, if you're in an abusive relationship, you can't just speak it. If they continue to do that, you have to take decisive action. It's not there for them to beat up on. And so an empowered move is, okay, what can I do now? But see, the, the focus is still back on me or on us, how to respond to what happened. And so with that awareness of being responsible also becomes maturity and the wisdom to know how to respond and when to respond. But it starts with the awareness that we're responsible for our experience, our emotions, our thoughts, and our actions, and let them be responsible for theirs. So that's it's a difficult thing to hold because it's not encouraged in society. 95% of the world out there still blames. Still, <laughs> I mean, they're still saying they did it to me. They jump from this event straight to the emotion and saying they made me feel this. They hurt me. And that breaks down the ability for us to be responsible for our experience. Don't we say responsibility is sort of synonymous with blame? And it, that's a hard thing to sever because it really isn't. I mean, it could have many other synonyms, couldn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Blame is just another way to redirect it. And we could blame ourselves. And that happens very often, too. We belt, beat ourselves up or we've learned that we're guilty, we're not enough, we have shame. We're beating up the self that we should be taking care of and being compassionate to and recognizing that they're just learning. Yeah. Uh, guilt is another form, a way that others create control. They make you feel guilty or shame in order to control you. They're projecting their experience onto you or an experience onto you. They're responsible for it. Instead of us just, no, as kids, we don't know any different. We just learn what we learn. And that's where, as we grow up, um, that's where we need to notice that by feeling the feelings and saying, okay, what is this about? What does it communicate? What, are, what does this mean? What am I thinking here that's causing this emotion? I'm not enough. I'm unworthy. Uh, they're going to hurt me. It's not safe. Well, then we go to that, not the emotion. The emotion's just the messenger. And we don't want to shoot the messenger. We want to listen to it because emotions are good. Yeah. But we don't want to be controlled by emotions. We want to find the message that they're offering and then address the message. And once we do, then we can correct the source of the emotions, which is the meaning. And if I say it's raining outside and I say it's raining because I was going to go walk in the park, then I may feel bad. But if I say it's raining and I didn't plan on doing anything, I don't feel anything because the meaning has changed. 
Well, I am responsible for that meaning. So any external event we project the meaning onto, it's the meaning that produces the emotion. So how and can we go about changing that meaning? Well, and that's where we go back and first recognize it. We go to the emotion notes, okay, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling upset. My throat is hurt tight. I have this tightness in my chuck. My stomach is butterflies or whatever it is. We have this emotional um, emotion or sensation. You say, okay, what is this going, what's going on? What does this mean? What am I thinking? And so we go to the thought as best we can as a query. And then say, okay, what does that mean? Now, then we can evaluate the thought and saying, okay, is this true? Are you sure it's true? Which is a little bit of Byron Katie, if you've ever studied and heard with the word, she mm -hmm. used that very effectively. Is this true? Are you absolutely sure this is true? Because we've made an assumption about an event and the assumption has caused us to create a conclusion. This happened and therefore. Mm. And when we do that, that creates the emotional experience, whether it's good or bad. And we can control how we interpret that assumption. And so we look at that assumption saying, okay, was this, is my thinking rigid? Is this black and white? Have I catastrophized it? It'll always be like this. Or was it just a, is it just a distortion in our thinking? And so if we look at that objectively, then we can start to break down some of those supports that created the emotion. So ideally we feel the emotion, we notice it. And the truth is if you notice an emotion for 90 seconds without feeding it, don't feed it any thought, feel the emotions and don't analyze it. It'll be gone in 90 seconds. Oh, wow. Because there's nothing to fuel the emotion. Good Granted, a lot of this stuff is unconscious and they're unconscious things to drive it. But most of the emotions we feel, if we go into them, notice them, feel them, step into the emotion fully. I feel it in my gut. I feel it in my heart, my threat, the tension in my neck. Just notice it. Don't feed it any thought. Don't analyze it. And it'll eventually just start to, it has nothing to support it. It just fizzles away. Then, you go to, what was that about? What was I thinking? What was driving that? And then you can start looking at the, the thoughts or the beliefs that are supporting this emotional experience, this messenger telling you to pay attention. There's something that's not aligned with what you want. Whether it's fear, whether it's uh, a want or desire, or whatever it is, the emotions and sensations are messengers. Just like if it's your body, you break a leg, the messenger is pain telling you to pay attention. The same thing with an emotion is driven by a thought. And so the thought is misaligned or there's something going on that wants your attention. And often when we just give it attention, it says, great, I just want you to listen to me. And then we can decide what we do because sometimes we confuse fear with excitement because fear and excitement are very close. When you're afraid, your heart beats faster, your breathing increases, uh, your heart rate goes up and your palms start to sweat. Well, you know, when you're excited, your heart rate increases, your breathing speeds, your palms start to sweat. And so sometimes it's just noticing, okay, is this excitement because something new is happening I'm looking forward to? Or is it fear of the unknown and I don't know what's gonna happen? But you can investigate it, saying, okay, and is this fear founded? Are you, is it a threat of your life? You're going to speak in front of public, in public. Okay, is that fear or is that just excitement? Is something new? The, the adrenaline, the, all the, the cascade of hormones and all those kinds, is preparing you to act effectively. Your mind is sharper. So these are good things, too. When you have this, these hormones like um, epinephrine or adrenaline and cortisol, these are stress hormones, but they also are focusing hormones. They help you think clearly and pay attention to where you're at. Well, these are great if you're interacting in an effective way. So noticing the emotion, stepping into it fully, allowing it to give you the message, and then making a query that way you can effectively respond to whatever the message was.
So that's one way for you to be responsible for your emotions and for the thoughts. Am I going to continue to embrace this thought or will I choose something else? I'm afraid. Well, I can handle this because courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is acting in the presence of fear. So you can choose to be afraid or you can choose to be courageous. Or yeah. Courageous. Yeah. So, so that's where our choice comes in. We have, and we, we evaluate the options based on those choices. Does that make sense? I know yeah. I'm kind of rambling a little bit. So the meaning, meaning that we give to it can help us to go down the trail to find where we developed this meaning. It's not a blame thing at all. Uh, it's investigation and a choosing rather than it makes me think of the react respond and now I'm attaching respond to responsibility. Uh, it gives me the ability to respond rather than react when exactly. I do have responsibility. I love that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Yeah. And the truth is when we start to make a distinction between what I can respond to and what I'm responsible for, it changes how we look at things. Now, obviously, we, if we see somebody in distress, we want to respond to them. But that doesn't mean we're responsible for their distress. If they're angry and upset and screaming, okay, we can feel like, okay, did I do something wrong? Am I guilty? Or we can say, okay, this isn't me. This isn't about me. I didn't cause this. They're responsible for their experience, not me. Yes. Now, and then you can say, how can I respond to that? By asking, how can, is there something you need? Did I use something to upset you? And in that way, we can self-reflect too. Is my, are my actions ineffective? Are they producing results I really don't want? That doesn't mean we're responsible for their upset, but it can allow us to recognize we have places where we can grow and we can be more effective and how we communicate what we want. And so reflecting on that without feeling like we did something wrong or we're bad or we're not enough, we can say, okay, this is an opportunity to learn how to communicate more effectively. And it's kind of, well, thanks, I didn't know I did that. I'll have to evaluate that. So we take ownership or we say, yeah, no, that wasn't me, that's, that's you. I'm not, I'm not accepting responsibility for your experience here. You need to deal with that. And we let it go. Uh, so that's that's the first one of the fundamental steps in being more mature and growing up is recognizing our responsibility. And the truth is, many of us were raised by parents who were adult adolescents. Yes. And most of many times we recognize that. We look back now at our age, kind of like, man, they were they acted like children. Well, they were still stuck in that, and they taught us. So we know the source. Okay, great. It still means we still need to address our part. We can't control them. They had their stuff. They did the best they could. Their parents taught them, just like they taught us. And so the bottom line is when we take responsibility, we're saying, fine, all that, it stops here. <laughs> From now on, I choose how I want to think. I want to choose how I feel. And this is a practice, too. It just doesn't happen overnight. It's yeah. like exercising a muscle. You need to go out there and actively do it. And that's notice your experience. Step into it without analyzing it. Allow it to be felt fully. And then find out what the source of that upset or emotion was. Yeah, it's a big responsibility. It's a ginormous subject. And it's pervasive and the implications on many levels on how we got where we are, how we can get where we want to go, how the others influence us that are not responsible for their emotions or their thinking. And that's a lot of people out there. I mean, if you think about it, how many people do you know that purpose are purposely and consciously responsible for their emotions? where something triggers them, they say, you know, that kind of upset me. I need to look at that. 
or they just don't get upset at all. They just recognize what they're responsible for and what the other one's not. See, once you start recognizing what you're responsible for, the distinction between yours and theirs becomes clearer. I know it's mine and that's not it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then you can, then you're saying, oh, I'm very in control. I'm very calm because I know what you're doing has nothing to do with me. If you're not responsible for your experience, how do you learn? How, how do you learn it was right or wrong if you're not responsible? And the thing is, you gain wisdom through experience. So if you're not taking responsibility, then your wisdom is, is just gone off the page. You can't build wisdom if you're not taking responsibility for your choices purposely. And then you learn from that, not through guilt and shame, but saying, you know, it worked or it didn't work. There's no good or bad. There's value in all learning. Yes. Even if it's, and the road to success is littered with failure. That's part of the passage, right? And so we should be willing to invite in the failures as much as the success. Sometimes we learn more from the failures. But if we're afraid of being responsible for the failure, because we'll feel guilty or ashamed, then we don't get the wisdom. We don't learn and we don't move more effectively. And so again, being responsible is, is, an, is an elephant. And um, <laughs> it just is. It's a big part of, of our fundamental basis for life. You know, how do you choose what you value? How do you act on what you value if you're not responsible? How do you act on your principles if you're not responsible? It's moving the locus of control back to where it should be. So you're empowered. You're in control. You choose what you want based on this foundation of values and principles that you're responsible for, not somebody else. Um, but it's recognizing that and the willingness to act on that. And it's not easy. And it, 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 it goes against most of the learnings we have in most social structures. So, so be a trailblazer. Well, Chip, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been a wealth of information. I thank you. I hope you're going to be making some videos or writing some blogs to give us some more of your wisdom. Is that a possibility Thanks, I, in the future? <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I'm getting ready to launch a webinar for practitioners to help them gain more confidence and competence in their uh, working with clients. So, so we'll, well see. I look forward to hearing more about that. Great, great. Right. Well, thanks, Kim. I appreciate the time. Thank you. And if any of you would like to have a session with Chip or get in touch with him, I'll have his information at the end of this video. Remember, no matter what you've experienced in the past, today is a new day. See you next time.